As a professional, my experience of GenLab is paying off so much. I never have worked with uh, space biology before, never. The data I'm having access now and the kind of ways I have to think now that's so multifactorial and so related to physics and metallurgy and biology and statistics and how to put everything together in a way that makes sense is making me a better scientist. So when I look at the data, I look at the data without any expectation and without any prior knowledge of what could be causing that. So when you put people from all around the world with all different backgrounds, they look to the same data as you and you don't know what they're going to see because they have different backgrounds. So the, the potential of GenLab project or in making this kind of research to go faster and broader are gigantic. And this by itself is wonderful. If humanity is to become a multi-planetary species and have people living and working on the moon and on Mars, we need to ensure that we can grow food locally for them. Three, two, one. We've had three successful space launches, and we're the first lab to say that the plants that we engineered for the space flight environment grew better than the wild type. Space is a stressful environment because of the lack of gravity. The Gilroy Lab studies how plants grow in space to better understand what it might take to have strong growth and good yields to support astronaut health. A lot of students at the University of Wisconsin have been involved in helping us explore the research that we're doing with NASA. We need to work with engineers and computer programmers to develop new tools in order to create stresses on Earth that replicate the spaceflight environment. This work can be used as a roadmap in the future to accelerate the adaptation of plants to the spaceflight environment. Space Gardening Presented by Science at NASA Roman statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero said, If you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. Humans attempting someday to make Mars their home may well share the sentiments expressed by the orator from ancient Rome. As for the library, Books can now be stored digitally. But how does your garden grow in space? To find out, scientists have been studying plant growth on the International Space Station, or ISS. The results could help boost the productivity of both extraterrestrial and earthly gardens. Recently, the ISS has been home to some impressive harvests, yielding tasty snacks for crew members. However, Scientists aren't through trying to unlock the secrets of how plants grow away from home. Future space outpost dwellers will need to grow plants for food and for recycling air and water, says Annalisa Paul of the University of Florida. So we're studying how plants adapt to the spaceflight environment. Our findings will also help us understand how plants might respond to new and challenging environments here on Earth. Paul and her colleague Robert Furl have been growing plants in space since 1999 when they launched their first experiment on Space Shuttle Columbia. Several space station experiments followed. One of their most compelling discoveries was that certain root growth strategies assumed to require gravity really don't. 
Plant roots seek water and nutrients by growing away from where they're planted. To determine which direction to grow, terrestrial plants use gravity as a cue, and they use touch to maneuver around obstacles. In the late 1800s, Charles Darwin demonstrated that plants growing along a tilted surface don't send their roots directly away from the seed, but instead send them to the right or left. He hypothesized that this growing pattern, called skewing, was caused by a combination of the roots touching their way across the slanted surface and gravity pulling straight down on them. In an experiment in 2010, Paul and Furl discovered, however, that roots of plants growing in microgravity on the station skewed like their earthly counterparts. The ISS showed us something we never would have known otherwise, notes Paul. Gravity isn't essential in root orientation. Good news. That's one less impediment to growing plants in space. Plants will efficiently seek the nutrients they need without gravity as a cue. The experiment also studied the patterns of genetic expression. Space plants changed the way they expressed their genes in order to produce specific proteins helpful in zero gravity. Paul explains, when living organisms are faced with environmental change, their response almost always involves a change in genetic expression. To cope, they switch on and off certain genes. Plants are pros at this. Paul says, plants' cell walls undergo a kind of remodeling in space. The genes associated with a cell wall are often in the opposite switch positions than they're in on Earth. The researchers aren't yet sure what purpose this serves, but they intend to find out with additional experiments. Paul and Furl aren't alone. Many other scientists have also been studying plant growth on the space station to unlock the secrets of successfully growing plants in this novel environment. At the heart of all the research is the quest to provide humans with everything they need, wherever they may be. For more about gardening in space, visit www.nasa.gov station. For more on the growth of science both on and off our home planet, visit science.nasa.gov. So then we kind of went for the home run experiment, um, which is actually trying to get a sample that uh, originated on the ISS. And the goal was really to show that you could go all the way from a sample to an answer, all on board. I am going to do this really neat experiment today. Last week we took some surface samples, microbial surface samples. There will be enough DNA after we magnify it to sequence it. And then from that sequence then we can determine what type of bacteria it is. So it's going to be really exciting for us, I think, to try and do this for the first time all on board the space station. In that moment, she's in the, the microgravity science glove box as she's collecting those cells. My heart was just pounding because what she did had never been done. Our DNA cake is in the PCR oven. We'll look forward to getting lots and lots of DNA from each of those three little bacteria colonies.
They're like, we can just patch your cell phone in to the space to ground loops and you can just talk to Peggy on your cell phone to do this. There's a hurricane raging literally outside, but the folks in Marshall, they're on it. They're gonna make this happen. Science on station is not stopping because of Hurricane Harvey. And right away, we saw one microorganism pop up and then a second one. I thought, oh my gosh, I am watching the first sequences ever of an unknown from space. I checked several times, like I ran like a biochemical test and then I ran two different sequencing tests. We are 100% sure that our samples that we got back on the ground are exactly the same that we got on orbit. We did it, everything worked perfectly. As a microbiologist, my goal is really to that when we go and we move beyond ISS and we're headed towards Mars or, or the moon or wherever we're headed to, we have a process that the crew can have that great understanding of the environment based on molecular technology. Subscribe for more space. Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Gary Jordan. Lots of science on board this week, but one stands out as the MVP. NASA astronaut Drew Foistel inserted food cylinders in the Multi-Use Variable G Platform, or MVP. MVP is a facility that subjects many types of samples like fruit flies, flatworms, plants, fish, cells, protein crystals, and in this case food, to artificial gravity. The platform has two internal carousels that can simultaneously produce up to two Gs. On Earth, we're all stuck with one G, no matter where we go. The International Space Station is the only research facility where gravity can be a variable long-term for experiments. Ground. We'll see you next week. Subscribe for more space. space, space, space. Roundworms have the right stuff. Presented by Science at NASA. Humans have long been fascinated by the cosmos. Ancient cave paintings show that we've been thinking about space for much of the history of our species. The popularity of recent sci-fi movies suggests that the human mind just might be coming to grips with the harsh environment out there. The human body is another matter. When gravity is greatly reduced, as in spaceflight, we no longer use our muscles to resist the usual pull of a planetary mass, and without additional exercise, astronauts lose both bone and muscle. 
Additionally, studies have shown that other parts of the body change in space like the bend of the spine, the amount of blood in the body, and eyesight. As we are now, prolonged voyages into outer space may be limited by our physical abilities. But a tiny new astronaut could provide much-needed insight into the ways that our bodies behave in microgravity. The noble roundworm. It may come as a blow to the ego, but roundworms, or Cynarhabditis elegans, share a considerable amount of genetic material with humans. Enough, in fact, to make them good candidates for a new study designed to determine how low-gravity environments affect astronauts. Roundworms, like fruit flies, are often used as models for larger organisms. This is because their short lifespans allow for scientists to observe several generations of worms within a short period of time, yielding quicker results for studies. In a new investigation entitled Alterations of C. elegans, Muscle Fibers by Microgravity, crew members of the International Space Station will grow two batches of worms, one in microgravity and one in a centrifuge, allowing the worms to experience simulated gravity. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, will be spearheading the investigation. The astronauts will cultivate multiple generations of the organism, so we can examine the organisms in different states of development, says Atsushi Higashitani, principal investigator for the experiment with Tohoku University in Miyagi, Japan. Our studies will help clarify how and why these changes to health take place in microgravity and determine if the adaptations to space are transmitted from one cell generation to another without changing the basic DNA of an organism. The results from the experiment could impact more people than just future astronauts. Spaceflight causes many changes in human health. Understanding these changes is important when planning for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and for managing health and disease on Earth. There are components of rodent biology that are directly related to human biology. Almost every gene found in humans so far has been found in a closely related form in the rodent. We can use the rodent research model for understanding human changes in space. Because changes occur more quickly in rodents, we can study these changes more effectively. On the space station, the rodents will live in a specifically designed habitat. Researchers use both similarities and differences between humans and rodents to gain insight into changes brought about by spaceflight. These insights can improve the health of astronauts and those of us on Earth. Rodent spaceflight studies have already contributed to pharmaceutical development for treating osteoporosis. The knowledge and applications that we gain from rodent research in space are limitless and promising for those in space and on Earth. Following delivery, group the rodents within standard vivarium cages and have the animals acclimate to NASA nutrient-upgraded rodent food bars, lick sits, and raised wire floors until the animals are loaded into the transporter. For travel between the Earth and the International Space Station, 
place 10 mice per side into each transporter for a total of 20 mice per transporter. Once on the International Space Station, attach the Animal Access Unit to the transporter and use mouse transfer boxes to transfer five mice at a time to the habitats. To load the mice into the habitat, detach the animal access unit from the transporter and attach the unit to the rodent habitat. Then transfer the animals from the mouse transfer boxes to the rodent habitats where they will reside for the duration of the mission. Every day, video of the animals inside the habitats is examined by trained staff to monitor the health and well-being of the rodents. Guidance and oversight for all work involving animals is provided by an attending veterinarian. Infrared imaging is used to see animals inside the habitats during the dark phase of the light-dark cycle, when mice are typically most active. This camera view shows food bars at the top of the frame, an access door and window on the left, and infrared lighting on the right. The water source is outside the camera view, behind the food bars in this view. This is the ground control habitat on day two of the study, during the dark phase of the light-dark cycle. This habitat is oriented on Earth with the waste tray at the bottom of the cage. The camera view is looking downwards along the gravity vector. The animal closest to the camera is sitting on top of the food bars eating. There are five mice in this habitat, although only a few are usually observed at one time. Mice tend to prefer enclosed, nest-like places such as the recessed space between the food bars and the cage wall, where they are seen congregating in this view. This is also the location of the water source. The mice are ambulating, grooming, and showing social interactions that are typical behaviors for mice on Earth. Mice use all six walls of the habitat to freely move around and are observed frequently climbing up and down the walls. This is the flight habitat on day two of the study, during the dark phase of the light-dark cycle, when mice are typically most active. During spaceflight, as on Earth, the mice move around the habitat using all six sides of the cage. The mice actively explore and ambulate throughout the habitat and exhibit the same behaviors as mice on Earth, including eating, drinking, grooming, and social interactions. Mice use different methods to propel themselves about the compartment. Early during the flight, the mice were typically seen using their forelimbs to pull themselves along the wire mesh. Later during the flight, the mice tended to use all four limbs to run across the wire grid lining the habitat. The mice also move by floating from one location to another. As the mice acclimated to the habitat during the Rodent Research 1 study, they not only became adept at moving about the compartment, but also learned to anchor themselves to the walls using their tails and or paws. NASA is looking forward with anticipation to a new era of human spaceflight. This new era will have a profound impact on your life, with countless possibilities in the coming years. After the Apollo program, which took Americans to the moon, the Space Shuttle program gave us 30 years of outstanding achievement in space. The shuttle enabled the space program to conduct space research, fly science observatories, 
launch satellites, and assemble the International Space Station. The station, a partnership among five agencies representing 15 nations, has been continuously crewed since November 2000, enabling astronauts to gain valuable insight on how to live and work in space 365 days a year. In collaboration with engineers and scientists on Earth, astronauts have collected and stored solar energy, recycled wastewater to minimize water needs from Earth, conserved water usage, created the air they breathe by splitting water molecules with electricity, grown plants without gravity, and kept their bodies healthy in zero gravity. Research on board the space station has provided advances in biology and biotechnology, physics, material sciences, robotics, and many other disciplines. The station has lifted us high above political, cultural, language, and national boundaries to observe hurricanes, tsunamis, forest fires, and volcanic action from afar while circling the world every 90 minutes. Through at least 2024, the space station will have rotating six-member crews to advance research and technology in low Earth orbit, roughly 220 miles above the Earth. To replace the space shuttle, which is no longer delivering cargo and crew to the space station, NASA is entering an extraordinary new era. NASA is investing financial and technical resources to stimulate efforts within the private sector to develop and demonstrate safe, reliable, and cost-effective cargo and crew space transportation capabilities. Innovative spacecrafts and launch vehicles are changing the way cargo, and will change the way crews, are transported to the International Space Station and to low Earth orbit. Further, this is creating a market environment in which space transportation services are also available to private sector companies. Having opened low earth transportation to U.S. industry, NASA is focusing on developing two necessary elements for future human deep space exploration. A crew vehicle called Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle and a heavy lift rocket known as the Space Launch System or SLS. The programs for these vehicles are moving out, intensely focused on meeting the goal of flying the new rocket and Orion without crew by 2017, with the first crew flight to take place in 2021. Using the lessons learned from over 50 years of spaceflight, NASA is testing and building an advanced space exploration system that will take our astronauts to deep space destinations humans have never visited and return them safely to Earth. The Orion will be outfitted for long-duration missions that reach far beyond low Earth orbit. For this reason, the spacecraft will incorporate innovations and advancements in the crew escape system, electrical power system, rocket engines, navigation and flight control systems, and communication systems. Orion will also require radiation protection for the crew and safe, reliable life support systems. This new spacecraft will be launched on the SLS rocket, which will send astronaut explorers on more challenging and distant missions. The rocket will be the most capable U.S. launch vehicle built to date, and with the Orion, will enable human exploration into the solar system. To journey into deep space, NASA is pursuing an integrated space exploration strategy that supports both science and human spaceflight goals, and advances space exploration technology. Mission analysis and international discussions supporting this strategy are ongoing. NASA will ramp up our capabilities to reach and operate at a series of increasingly demanding destinations while advancing our technological capabilities with each step forward. This will include early test and demonstration flights between the Earth and Moon, with NASA planning to redirect a small asteroid to a distant retrograde lunar orbit and send humans to explore it then possibly visit one of Mars moons, Phobos or Deimos, or the surface of the red planet itself. By visiting a captured asteroid in lunar orbit, astronauts will learn how to do long-term space operations in a deep space environment while maintaining close proximity to Earth and gain vital information exploring territory untouched by humans since the formation of the solar system. An asteroid mission requires new space transportation vehicles and systems that are capable of operating in an environment with almost no gravitational field. NASA is conceptualizing habitat and spacewalking systems with new spacesuit designs and anchoring tools, 
and robots that can work side by side with the crew or be remotely controlled. Traveling to Mars is our ultimate goal. Why Mars? Like Earth, Mars has an atmosphere, water, ice, and evolving geology. Robotic rovers that NASA has sent to Mars are investigating whether the planet has ever been capable of supporting life. Because of its Earth-like attributes, Mars is seen as an excellent candidate for human exploration as we expand into the solar system. It could take up to six months to reach Mars. Then, because of flight trajectories, astronauts will have to leave within 30 days or remain on Mars for 500 days. On the way to Mars, the crew will have to cope with different kinds of stress in a high-risk, confined environment with limited communication with Earth. As NASA travels through the solar system, astronauts will need to communicate quickly with other spacecraft and Earth, and in emergencies, even hold video conferences. For this, NASA is developing a communication system to operate at higher radio frequencies and at optical frequencies using laser communication systems. A new internet system is being developed that will give each planet its own domain name. For example, www.alphabase.mars. The new system will even compensate for the great time delay in communicating between bodies in space, which is 29 minutes one way when Mars is closest to the Earth. The long voyage through deep space is filled with many dangers, including protons from solar flares, gamma rays from distant newborn black holes, and galactic cosmic rays from outside our solar system. Astronauts have not experienced complete exposure to deep space cosmic rays since the Apollo missions, which were of short duration. When astronauts are on the International Space Station, Earth intercepts about one-third of cosmic rays, and one-third are deflected by Earth's magnetic field. So, before sending humans into deep space, we need to research and develop new technologies and materials to protect astronauts. There are other health hazards to research before attempting long voyages as well. NASA has been continually investigating protective solutions for physiological changes that occur in heart function, bone mineral density, muscle mass, sensory motor skills, and the immune system. On the space station, we found that aerobic and resistive daily exercise protects the astronauts' bones, muscles, and heart very well. So exercise equipment will be necessary on longer exploratory missions. Additional challenges will arise with having small groups of people in an isolated environment for long periods of time, with prolonged interactions between humans and machines, and with maintenance of sufficient quantities of food with adequate nutrition. NASA is working to identify solutions for all of these challenges on future missions. Once on Mars, astronauts will find evidence of extensive water erosion, channels, and floodplains. Astronauts will extract subsurface water for their use. The crew will need surface systems to produce air to breathe, fuel for vehicles, and equipment to mine and process resources. But then, these astronauts will have the distinction of bringing Martian samples back to Earth, which will transform our understanding of Mars. As always, new technologies developed to overcome the challenges of interplanetary travel will also find applications that improve life on Earth. Thousands of technological spin-offs have benefited American industry and citizens in the decades since NASA's 1958 inception, while NASA's cost to the American taxpayer is currently less than one-half of one cent of each federal tax dollar. So today, NASA looks forward to writing the next chapter of human spaceflight with its commercial and international partners, advancing research and technology on the International Space Station, opening low Earth orbit to U.S. industry, and pushing the frontiers of deep space even farther. As NASA's next chapter in human spaceflight evolves, there are new and increasing opportunities for each citizen to experience low Earth orbit, to become involved in new facets of an expanding space economy, and to view new vistas in deep space virtually through NASA's exploration. As Space Shuttle Atlantis launched on the last mission of the shuttle program, astronaut commander Chris Ferguson said, we're not ending the journey today. We're completing a chapter of a journey that will never end. Please join us for the next exciting chapter of NASA's journey.